Hello and welcome to the Wild Hearts Business for Good podcast. My guest is Jen Rodwell, the Head of Digital Ethics and Tech for Good Practice at Sopra Steria, one of the world's leading digital transformation companies, where she is responsible for bringing to market services that address societal concerns. Jen is passionate about the power of technology, innovation and entrepreneurship to change the world for the better. She's also a member of the Wild Hearts School's National Advisory Board and has been a member of the Tech UK Women in Tech Council. Jen, thank you so much for joining us today. To help our listeners to get to know you better, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today? Thanks, Mick. I'm really delighted to be here speaking with you today. So um, I guess that's a tough question because I don't think that um, there was necessarily a path. And if there was, it was very windy and possibly quite obscured. (laughs) Um, I guess um, if I think about what motivates me that um, has been consistent throughout my life and probably was the the light shining in the darkness that um that i walked towards um over the course of of many years um i think about my childhood in in minnesota uh growing up in a very stable um happy home two parents um and a younger brother uh, very loving and having access to kind of all of the things that make a good, happy and safe childhood and not really ever kind of questioning that or, or feeling that 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 was um, anything unusual until I started to see some of the world and and see that it wasn't that way for everybody. And my parents' background, I think, is really interesting too. So um, both parents come from uh, ultimately farming backgrounds and they didn't have to necessarily end up where they were either providing kind of a middle class stable life for two young kids. Um, they they came, their, their parents and their parents' parents came out of the Great Depression and had tremendously difficult times. Um, but both of my parents ended up in a place where they were able to provide very well for for two kids and and provide a very good, solid foundation for life. Um, So I I think about that a lot um, in in terms of how I'm privileged and that not everybody has has that kind of opportunity and that that privilege and that start. When I think about um, how people don't necessarily have access to the education and the opportunities, even though they're they're just as smart and hardworking as my parents were, or or as I am certainly. Um, and so, thinking about that unfairness, I guess, and and wanting to make sure that people everywhere have the chance to live the best, most fruitful and fulfilling lives they can, is is really fundamentally what's been behind uh, the things I've tried out in life. Um, So the winding path then takes me to uh, university where I studied film, (laughs) which is kind of unusual. Um, But I I thought film was a good medium. Where did you study that, Jen? In Chicago at a film school called Columbia College and um, had a really good experience there um, and tested out some of the theories about film as a medium to address and amplify social concerns. Um, was convinced I was an artist when I left um, and went on my wa- merry way, living um, living a life like an artist, which really just means poor. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can relate to that. I can relate to not that. Not particularly productive. And um, thank goodness I had some some good experiences that that kept me on the path of just being interested in social topics. And eventually I came to a place where I I wanted to um, perhaps study human rights law. And I was living in Paris at the time and working for a financial services startup and um, had decided that I needed to shift gears and and, um, finally do something um, a bit more structured. And human rights law was was the thing. But this job gave me the opportunity to um, go try out uh, something called microfinance um, and look at it from that Ooh. firm's perspective to see if if um, microfinance could form part of our community giving program. So it was a really small firm. 
Um, but it was, they were, they really wanted to have some sort of CSR. And again, this is kind of the first time I'd ever heard of anything like corporate social responsibility. Um, and I went to Ecuador and saw how microfinance absolutely transformed um, the, the, the lives of the particularly women and children, but families in general, who were in absolute dire poverty, but gave them a chance to um, create a sustainable life for themselves, send their kids to school, um, women to start and expand businesses that gave them agency in their families, in their communities, and in their world. And that was my introduction to corporate social responsibility. And I thought, okay, wait a minute, I'd never thought about business as, um, as a particular driving force for good. And so I just stopped everything and decided I would go pursue an MBA with a focus on corporate social responsibility. Long story short, after that MBA, um, I got my first position working in sustainability at a technology company, had a wonderful opportunity there to um, look at how we could bring technology oriented uh, sustainability services to customers. And um, shortly after that had a, a similar opportunity at Sopristeria where I am now. And I've been working the past decade to bring sustainability life through technology and business, working with customers and within Sopristeria. area. Um, and now that's shifted a little bit to really, really focus on some of the, the biggest issues that are facing us right now with, with the intersection of things like um, technology, business, ethics and sustainability all coming together. And that's why we've started mm. this digital ethics and tech for good practice. This is my favorite part of the podcast when people that I know well in business give me an insight into their journey and there's always surprises in it, Jen, always surprises. And before we move on to, I really want to get into what digital ethics means because I find even your title fascinating. I want to come back to a question I always like to ask is, so you brought up a really privileged and fortunate environment because your parents' hard work and the price you're for your ancestors paid going through the depression, etc., but not all kids would have been aware of their privilege. They would have just taken it for granted or they would have just have gone on and lived a life, a wonderful life in the Midwest of the States. What was it? Was it you, something in you personally or was it your parent or fam parents or family's values that, that made you so aware of your privilege and then, more importantly, made you want to do something to help people that didn't have that? Where did that come from? I am absolutely sure it's um, some of the values that my parents instilled in us. Um, and just, you know, and and it's not through necessarily um, uh, particularly strong religious ties or or um, big speeches or anything that my parents compelled this, but just by being decent and mm -hmm. and um, welcoming everybody and being good neighbors and things like that. Um, that they demonstrated through life. But, uh, but I also think that there's just this um, uh, sense that it, it was unfair that not everybody had the opportunity that I did. Um, because I don't think it's just, for, to pick up on what you said, I don't think it's just because of hard work of my ancestors and my parents that, that I have what I have. Uh, there are institutional mm. barriers that persist today and we're seeing the fallout of these barriers now with a lot of um anger and hurt happening especially in you know back where i come from um being expressed and and justifiably mm -hmm. because there are are just tremendously unfair barriers to people who are equally as talented and equally as hardworking, and um it's more than time for that to change and i think that that's that's what's driven me and lots of the people that I have the privilege of working with. So before we come on to the specifics again of your current role um, and examples of that, um, can you give us an indication on that journey that you went on that either you can take, answer one of these questions, has there been an apparent failure or something that was a real setback in your life that you're actually grateful for now? Um, or, or you could answer both, what are you most proud of in that journey or most proud of in your career in general? Wow, those are, are big questions. Um, 
uh, probably too many failures to, to list, but I, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe it's, um, maybe it's the two combined actually. Um, and this is going to sound a bit clever, but I, I genuinely mean this. Um, it is the, the consistent and repeated failures, um, that have led to the things that I'm most proud of, I suppose. Um, I guess what I'm most proud of is that I do a job that I love and that I'm excited about every single day and that I get to be creative in and work with, you know, the smartest, most caring people in the world. Um, and I get to work on things that genuinely make a difference in the world. And I have a lot of creative freedom as well, um, which I'm very thankful for in my job. So I'm most proud that I've achieved those things because they're, I think, um, quite um, difficult for people to find. So I'm proud of that and also recognize that I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. But aside from the luck component of that, um, it's the willingness to take risks and have uh, lots of failures as I do that that um, have led me to where I am. So it's mistakes like, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I'm very happy I went to film school, it was amazing, but it, it I did not pursue the straight and narrow path. I chose all sorts of wild things to do in my life. Um, and I probably would have been making more money and um, higher up the corporate ranks, perhaps, <laughs> if I'd made um, decisions on the straight and narrow path that led me down the straight and narrow path. but. Um, experimentation, risk, and failure have led to something that I'm really, really happy about. Jen, the word straight and narrow don't really <laughs> jump into my mind when I think of you. <laughs> and, you know, it's the whole artistic process, which is the entrepreneurial process, but trial and error mm -hmm. and keeping going. Um, and I think it's wonderful, as you've pointed out, is that money and wealth are not the same things. And people may be higher up a corporate ladder if such a thing exists but not have any the sense of satisfaction that you've achieved, which is wonderful. Um, I, I want to talk to you now, but even when, when you told me, when we were chatting last year, I think, and you were saying that uh, you'd recently had a significant promotion and you were now head of digital ethics. And the thing that struck me is I just thought the business title was amazing. It was such an intriguing business title, this idea of digital ethics, because all the stuff about manipulation of elections and you know the the side of tech that I don't think people had ever been aware of was coming out into the fore. Um, what are digital ethics, Jen, and why mm. are they necessary? Um, it's a really good question, and uh, you've you've touched on it in in the lead up to your question there. Um, so, digital ethics is all about. Um, kind of taking a step back from digital or technology really um, uh, as tools and asking ourselves um, what what is the power of these tools that we're using now and what will go right and what will go wrong with them before we deploy them on on a massive scale so technology is just a, a tool and um, it can be used for for good or for bad and I think that there was so much promise and so much exuberance about technology for the past um, two or three decades. And there still is and there should be because technology is absolutely transformational, um, not only for businesses, but for the world and will be key to solving some of our most critical challenges. Um, but I think what we've seen in more recent years is a recognition that these tools have to be created thoughtfully and carefully and then used thoughtfully and carefully recognizing that when you do something with a digital technology the impact whether it's good or bad is going to be amplified um, much more quickly and on a much bigger scale than it would be uh, before we use these technologies these big technologies so when we think about ethics and in digital technologies it's asking ourselves about what um, what the potential good and bad is before these things are too far down the road to avoid some of the things you've described, like um, perhaps the, even the Cambridge Analytica scandal and Facebook. Um, and we're, we're approaching another election um, in the US that 
uh, faces probably similar risks, although Facebook is starting to put some guardrails in place now. Um, Facebook is kind of an, an obvious one, but even if we think about um, the A-level scandal of, of the recent news here in the UK, um, it demonstrates how alg algorithms that are designed probably genuinely with a benevolent intent or an intent to be fair still um, struggle with that, that original intention because they haven't had enough um, testing and insight from other experts and thinking about the implications on a diverse range of people in the instances of the A-level scandal. No, absolutely. I mean, it's such a vast subject. I think, to your point, um, and exuberance is a great word to describe the way evangelical tech gurus would talk about, you know, the great liberate, liberating force of technology and how it was going to level the field for everybody and create this almost harmonious world. And I think it's when human nature interacts with tech that you get increased atomization or tribalism. And in many ways, it's had the opposite effect. Um, I mean, I think, and I think I'd love us to explore this more, the idea of, you know, the law of unforeseen circumstances. So you and I touched on this in one of our previous conversations. When Gutenberg invented the printing press, I suspect strongly he didn't know it was going to lead to the Reformation, which would then would lead to the the Industrial Revolution, or the, the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, and then all the things that flowed from that, simply because people had access to information. And then if we take almost like the internet, it's like that on steroids. Could, do you think, could you think of any examples of the unforeseen consequences of the growth of tech that the, the people who developed that technology could never have imagined happening, good and bad? Sure. Well, I mean, exactly. Well, this is exactly what digital ethics is, is meant to help with. So there are millions of examples literally because they are as many as the the different technologies and the different scenarios in which those technologies are deployed um, but um i think there's been one that's bothered me quite recently if we're talking about the negative side of things a, an organization called robin hood in the u.s um, has created quite an interesting platform actually to to make investing um, more accessible to people who aren't investors by trade, um, which is great. I, I think that that's um, in principle about financial inclusion and, and, you know, making these products and services more available to people who uh, previously would have been kept out because of jargon and complexity. But in this instance, um, they used gamification on their platform to encourage people to invest while also showing um, showing users both the, the, the minute to minute kind of live wins and losses in their trading accounts. And um, users in the US were investing money for the first time, getting excited because of the gamification and the, um, the really smart user experience. And almost it became like a, a gambling casino scenario for some people. And one young man in the States um, saw that his account had had a loss of several hundred thousand dollars and went into deepest despair because he thought, how, how am I ever going to pay that back? And he, very, very sadly, he committed suicide. And that is, I recognize, an extreme example, but it serves to illustrate this point that um, when we use things like gamification or even really, really smart um, user experience and user and, and design, um, it's so important mm. to think about the potential consequences to individuals and on society more broadly. And it's not always possible to um, game out every every potential scenario and avoid everything. But I think what we have seen is probably a lack of um, consistent and systematic thinking about these things before the technology is created and deployed. And there's an opportunity to just take a moment to think about these things and do it iter 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 iteratively, make mistakes, um, get it and then improve. Um, but people get, I think, rightly very excited about the technology and, and don't stop and do this, this thinking that we're asking uh, be done. Do you know that reminds me? Um, 
we're working with Wild Hearts is working with uh, an amazing woman called Alicia Drummond, who's one of the UK's leading therapists and mental health experts for teenagers. And it's all part of the Wild Hearts Schools program where we now want to empower kids to understand and, and look after their own mental well-being. And one of the things we discussed is um, in, the, in the American context, and I suspect it can be mirrored exactly in the UK, is two of the key contributors to the explosion of mental health problems with teenagers was Facebook lowering their age of access to 13. So a little 11 year old girl, if she lied, could get access to Facebook. At the same time, the mass availability of the iPhone. And therefore this little girl could go on the internet or go on Facebook without having to be in a laptop, which maybe her mum could see in the, in the the dining room or the office in the house or living room or something. So this 11 year old had access to Facebook on a, a handheld device away from her parents' supervision. And it has been catastrophic, the effect it's had on kids, particularly girls' mental health. Now, of course, the inventors of the iPhone and the developers of Facebook didn't see that coming. How on earth are you meant to see the future like that, Jen? How are you meant to see into the future with that level of accuracy? Um, well, it won't be with that level of accuracy. For, uh, that is certain. But we know from the past decade or 15 years, probably, enough to um, challenge ourselves throughout the design process and think think about a wide variety of use cases. I mean, the criticism that gets lobbed at Silicon Valley um, developers and fairly, I think, in many cases, is that there's not very much diversity and they create technology based on their experience and usually based on their experience and for people like themselves. So they wouldn't have imagined um, an 11 year old girl or the many teenage girls and boys who are now suffering mental health because in some part because of their products, um, everything from lo loneliness and isolation to eating disorders and um, inflated expectations about what their bodies should look like and what their lives should look like. Um, and those are big issues. And again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is a, a way to um, anticipate every single potential negative outcome, but there has been to date really a, a severe absence of even trying to imagine some of the the, the negative consequences. And there are people who do these things. I mean, you can um, can work with futurologists and, and people who do th think about game theory um, to, to game out some of what might happen, but less kind of whizzy and, and experimental is, is some of the practices that are rooted in tech, like service design, um, design thinking, user experience, user research, um, but just think taking that from a, a a change in perspective, so you're you're not necessarily just thinking about how to design the most frictionless service, so that you get the most users doing the most um, things that make you the most money. But you're thinking about it from an ethics perspective and a person, a human perspective as well. So it's the same principles, just widening the thinking a bit. Okay, so coming on to the more positive examples then. I read an article recently where you said, it's opera theory, we want to use technology as a force for good, contributing to a positive future and improving people's lives. Can you give us some examples of how you're doing this? Because I've only highlighted the negative aspects of tech so far. Sure, so sure. Um, and thanks for bringing us back to that, because of course, there is the other side of this, that technology is absolutely critical to, um, and, and critical to solving the world's challenges, but also is already contributing massively um, to, to that solving. I mean, mm. um, say what you will about Zoom's early privacy issues during the, the early days of the pandemic when um, it was suddenly revealed that we could log on to Boris Johnson's calls um, if, we, if we wanted because his PIN number had been displayed. Um, the, the role technology has played in connecting those of us who are privileged enough to have it at home and, and have um, connectivity is tremendous um, and hugely beneficial. But for in, in our work, um, I guess uh, one of the uh, examples, I'll talk maybe about a couple of examples that we're really proud of at the moment. So we're working with a public sector organization who wants to fundamentally provide um, citizens with a better user experience on their web platform. 
And what that means to them is just helping them find the information that they're seeking on their website as easily as possible, as quickly as possible, but also knowing enough about what that user might actually want to know in addition to their initial search query to put mm -hmm. the right and most helpful information in front of them, even if it's not what they first went looking for. And they see that as part of, of this mission to better connect to citizens and to help citizens feel better connected to um, the community and to the council. Um, and they, they're going to do that by using more data. So they've asked us to help them understand um, how to use data to achieve those goals, which are fundamentally um, benevolent goals for citizens, but do it ethically. So we're, we're talking with them about um, ethics within their community, within their organization, what citizens' expectations are around um, a public, se public sector organization's use of data, um, what citizens' values are that should inform a digital ethics um, approach for data, and then we'll help them actually create a, a program to so they understand um, so, so they've actually created their own kind of data ethics framework so they can say in this scenario we will use citizen data because we know it has a genuine citizen benefit but in this scenario we probably won't do that because the benefit to the citizen isn't as strong as um, the benefit to us or the risk of something going wrong with um, with use of data like a data breach so it's taking them through the process so they can do what starts out as a fundamentally good thing, but to make sure that the citizen's best interests are in mind. So there's a tendency to think that, well, it's often said data is the new gold or the new oil. The more of it you have, the richer you'll be. And that's really in conflict with, with digital ethics and with data ethics, um, because there's so much risk in, in what could happen to users and citizens if that data is misused. So that's one thing um, that mm -hmm. we're we're really excited about right now. And the other project um, is on the tech for good side. So about creating technology from the very beginning that is specifically focused on addressing a social issue. We're working with our charity partner, EDAT, which is a digital skills charity in London. And they provide digital skills training and qualifications to some of the most underserved people in London. And that's everybody from people with, with learning difficulties to multi-generational unemployment to refugees and asylum seekers and giving people a chance to get into the world of work in a, in a productive and well-paying um, good job. So we're working with them to create a digital platform that will help people like their students, but actually like lots and lots of people, who are about to face a lot of change because of technology-driven disruption in the jobs market. So Mick, there are some incredible mm -hmm. stats right now about um, how technology is going to very quickly change the world of work. And we're seeing that on an accelerated scale since COVID really. But before COVID, the statistics were that there mm -hmm. are 6 million people in the UK who in the next few years um, will who are right now in jobs that in the next few years will disappear or be radically transformed because of changing demographics um, and technology. And all of those people will need to get into other kinds of work. And we don't yet know necessarily what that work looks like. We know some of it, but not all of it. And if we're going to undertake a reskilling program nationally on that scale, digital technology has to play a role in that because it's not going to be classroom based. It's not going to be down to the schools and the universities and the colleges. It has to, in the traditional sense, it has to happen online using technology at scale. Interestingly though, um, we don't know that much. I mean, we collectively don't know that much about what makes um, a quality digital learning experience, what's effective. A lot of the digital learning experiences um, have been based on traditional models, traditional classroom models. So we face um, high costs. Um, courses can be quite expensive. 
We face barriers in terms of the time it takes to engage with digital learning, which isn't going to be appropriate for people who have families and other work commitments. It's not your, your typical university student types who are going to be need, needing this kind of reskilling and upskilling. So all sorts of, of barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of an actual digital experience and how people absorb the information they're getting through learning in a digital environment. So right now, Sophrosteria is um, testing out hypotheses with um, technology and, and real life people who are likely to be in this scenario to see what works and to, to build technology interventions um, to help drive a more effective learning experience for people. So for example, um, we might use something like a chatbot to help people who might be stalling a little bit in their studies and might need a friendly little prompt to help them feel confident that they can engage or if they're not, if they're not able to engage on the digital platform, then a human tutor um, or instructor or coach or mentor or colleague could come on and um, help them where, wherever they're having trouble. Um, or we, we will use AI potentially and automation and personalization to create a tailored learning experience based on what we know about an individual and their circumstances. Do they have the ability to spend five minutes um, a day learning or do they have an hour, an hour and a half to really engage with something longer and to personalize the content with that? And all of that is really about helping people find the best pathways to learning it so that they can engage with content um, that will help them into the, the world of work that's fast uh, fast approaching for many of us. It's utterly fascinating the power of tech and the impact it can have on education. Um, we saw it during the lockdown with Microtycle. Um, so many kids have been taking part in Microtycle in their schools and we pivoted very quickly into a, a virtual competition. and the numbers expanded exponentially and we would never even consider doing that unless there'd been a schools lockdown. Um, this leads me on to a point that you said in a recent article, which was when we return from the crisis, you said, well, we're returning to a world that uses more tech, not less. That means that the ethical challenges that existed before the pandemic will be accelerated unless we've laid the groundwork and equipped ourselves to make better decisions. And two areas that you you highlighted was um, access to services, uh, unintended discrimination or bias, or the other one that I'm personally fascinated about is how do we use tech to protect people from social isolation? This idea that, you know, if you don't have access to tech and there's some kids getting a, an enhanced and enriched education experience, and then there's other kid who doesn't have access, um, they're going to fall further behind. So we'll actually worsen social mobility or social exclusion. Um, how can how can tech address these issues? What are you doing to address them? The social isolation and uh, potential for massive inequality, uh, deepening the, the, the existing inequality um, quickly and entrenching it more because of COVID is one of my biggest concerns right now um, for exactly the reasons you've described. The kids who were already disadvantaged are just exponentially more disadvantaged in this environment and we we have to solve that um i'm i've been heartened very recently to hear about some of the work that um local governments are doing and and it's not cheap and it's not easy but they're um putting putting that aside and just saying we need to get technology out to people who don't have it to kids and families who don't have it no matter the cost because the the long-term cost to our societies, of, and of course the individuals, is um, unconscionable. So they're sending out Wi-Fi dongles and hotspots and and laptops and and the technology that that families need to get these kids involved. And it's not perfect. I mean, um, young kids in particular will will just probably not um, be able to engage with virtual digital education in a way that is as effective as in-person learning. And that's something we need to get to grips with. And hopefully there will be a solution to the, the virus soon um, so we can move beyond that. But those interventions are really, really critical. 
So the second thing about social isolation and, and growing inequality, I think, is it, it's a real bee in my bonnet, actually, Mick, because um, AI and these amazing technologies that are are going to help organizations in the world solve some of the, the biggest problems. There's so much potential, um, but there is a lot of work to do left, I think, on addressing the, the bias that's inherent in so is not inherent, that is just in so many of these technologies and these solutions. Um, there's a there's a lot of um, talk about the promise of these technologies to enable better decision making. And when you're thinking about this as a, I don't know, a central government department trying to imagine what public policy should be in using technology and data and analytics and AI to to make huge decisions or an org, a, a business trying to make big, big, big decisions because you have the data, the analytics and, and the AI, if those um, if those decisions are based on data that's flawed or, or um, processing and algorithms that's flawed with bias, then we're not actually making better decisions. And that's what drives me crazy. <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot um, of interesting kind of conversation about human versus machine. Um, it's not, it's never that simple, is it? Because of course, humans are are biased as well. And probably the, the best approach to using these technologies and to making decisions is to equip humans to um, interpret data and to use um, recommendations from machines to make the decisions that are actually right, because we can always hold a human responsible more than we can hold a, um, a machine responsible. But what I'm really getting at here is that as these technologies are more and more widely deployed um, in all sorts of instances, including in education, if we don't fix this bias problem, then we're just more deeply entrenching this in inequality. And there's so that we can do better. We, we absolutely can do better. We know this is an issue. Um, and I'm just encouraged by the fact that people are thinking about this, but we have to get it right before we, um, before these technologies become de facto and, and so widespread that everything that we see flaws and bias everywhere. Jen, could you give us an example of how somebody interacting with AI, perhaps not even realizing that they're chatting with a, or, or interacting with a machine rather than a human, that what kind of discrimination or bias they could experience? Sure, that's such an interesting question. And actually, um, there's a, a bigger question, I think, ethically about whether it's right for us to not know whether we're interacting with a human or not. Um, we would say absolutely not. And, and there needs to be more clarity around when we're talking to a machine and when we're not. Um, but from a from a bias perspective, some of these solutions just haven't been um, I haven't thought about different kinds of users and how they might come with different questions or, or different needs. And you see this in the form of um, chatbots and voice recognition systems, not recognizing um, certain dialects or different accents and therefore not being able to provide a service. And that might not be such a big deal if you just want to, I don't know, um, browse on a, a website and perhaps purchase a roll of toilet paper or something. But but if you're um, inquiring about your benefits or something that actually has real, real impact on your life, you need to be able to get a certain quality of service. And there are lots of, uh, this is changing quite rapidly and I, organizations and developers are getting this uh, and the technology to understand a wider variety of users has improved massively. But um, we need to keep an eye on that and make sure that it continues to evolve and, and consider a, a, a wide variety of, of user needs. The other thing I would say, um, not necessarily about chatbots, but facial recognition, we've got such um, interesting movements in the technology market for facial rec recognition, thanks in huge part to the Black Lives Matter movement and seeing that companies, that the makers of these technologies now are not willing to send them into a marketplace where they can't necessarily control the ethics around their use. So if if there's an uncertainty in their accuracy and that's translated into bias against 
citizens, then the vendors are actually pulling that from market. So, so with facial recognition technology, I think some of the best ones can only claim an upward accuracy range of 70 or 80 percent. So that means that um, in some instances, police might uh, have a 30 percent chance of of interacting with someone who isn't meant to be accused of anything. And that can lead to all sorts of negative um, impacts as we've seen play out, particularly in the States. 30% error for interacting with the police is quite alarming. Yeah, again, <laughs> if you're just buying some loo roll and, and you know, your chatbot doesn't recognize what you want, the, the consequences are, are very small, so it doesn't matter. But when you get into these life-changing events, um, thinking about how somebody interacts with the justice system, a 30% error rate or, or thereabouts is is unacceptable. Jen, coming to the, the voice recognition, I remember when um, back in the day when it first came out and, you know, these tech uh, gurus that I was talking to were really excited that this, uh, you could just speak to your laptop and it would type for you. My friends and I all knew that it wouldn't recognise Scottish accents. I <laughs> love that old it took about 10 years of development before. I mean, I was very pleasantly surprised when I chatted away and it, the computer understood me perfectly. I was like, oh, wow, well, they've evolved. They can understand the Scottish <laughs> accent. So we've brought up... To, we, <laughs> so it's interesting that, um, yeah, it's a, there's, you know, there's a whole series of jokes about that. Um, the, the, the future is positive, though. I think, again, in that same article that I've been quoting you from quite uh, throughout this, uh, this interview... You said across all metrics, companies that think and act in an ethical and sustainable way outperform those that don't. That is something that gives me such faith for the future of business in the world. Why do you think that is the case, that companies that are doing the right thing and are um, implementing the policies and thought processes that you champion, that they're actually commercially performing better? Yeah, it's, again... um really, really important to not get too bogged down in, in the risk and the dark side, um, because the flip side of, of everything we've talked about is actually tremendous opportunity. Um, so even when we're talking about mm. um, bias and unfairness in service and that potential, the the mirror image of that is actually what, what, what could happen for businesses if they, if they, avoid that if they eliminate the unfairness and the bias well then that user that citizen has a very positive experience of their organization and if we're talking about a commercial organization um, is a new customer who's totally bought into the, who's had a great experience and is totally bought into the brand and and um, you know is is with you um, so I guess to answer your question when organizations, um, excel at some of these these ethical principles like getting diversity and inclusion right um, and showcasing their their values um, as part of their their brand and their image they do financially perform better so we know that uh, companies with strong ethical and sustainability credentials outperform the market um, on almost all metrics but um, by 14. 0.4%, I think I read in, in some recent study in terms of revenue, but it's it's revenue, it's profitability, it's, um, it's uh, market capitalization, employee engagement, ability to attract talent and retain talent. Um, all of these are the business benefits of getting this stuff right. And it, it, it all kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because if you have diversity in your organizations, um, then you've got a whole bunch of smart people from different perspectives challenging positively what you're doing and contributing different views to make what you do better um, before you even bring it to market. And then if you and and then when you do bring it to market and it's made for the widest group of people with their values and their needs and their expectations in mind, then you've just opened up um, your product or service to a much wider group of people. So you've got more customers, more satisfied customers. So it just makes 
tremendous sense to, to do this stuff and to put the work in. The point you make about diversity of mind is crucial. You know, I think people think of diversity of whether a, a religious backgrounds or a racial background or whatever, but the idea of differences of opinions and people seeing things differently, um, then you always end up getting a far more robust and uh, product that's fit for purpose if you've got people with different perspectives contributing to it. I mean, you're right. I mean, in this, this chat, it's made it sound as if we're all talking about this dystopian future because of tech. I think, to your point, it's because tech is so transformative. It's delivered so many incredible freedoms and, um, you know, evolutions, if you will, that's benefited people. I think it's because we know it's going to expand that we're having a conversation of the people who are being left behind or its negative impact. Because all we ever heard was, all anybody ever spoke about before was again in that very evangelical mm. tone about the only thing it, tech was going to deliver was benefits. And we're going, well, not not so much. But it's because it is so all pervasive. I think it's fantastic we now have leaders like you that say, well, look, let's look at the potential downside. I mean, as you and I have chatted before, um, the people who will not have access to tech because of its all pervasive nature now will almost be like the illiterates of the past. And how curtailed would your life be if you literally couldn't read? Um, so I think that's why it's such a serious subject and people are talking about it now. Looking to the future, um, you've said that you believe the message, and I hope you're you're flattered, Jen. I've been reading all your articles <laughs> avidly. I've been quoting you throughout this. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have said that you believe the message that sustainable businesses are more likely to be successful is gaining traction. And this was a line that you said, which I really liked, that the conversation around CSR had changed from one of corporate responsibility to more of a mind of opportunity of getting it right. What opportunities do you see? What were the ones that you're most excited about if we get this right? Absolutely. Well, I, I think it, it is exactly as we were just discussing that the no matter how you look at this, there are advantages to doing it right now. I'm I'm not saying that there's not money to be made doing it the wrong way because there are lots and lots of examples of of companies, um, Facebook, Google depending on what you think of them making or uber a good example as well making lots of money and um just kind of riding out the ethical criticism that they're getting um but most organizations are not going to be google's facebook's or uber's and nor should they be um and you can do very very well while doing very very good i think is the answer so it, it is about um making better products for a wider group of users or customers or citizens. Um, the other thing that, that strikes me from, from what you just said is we talked a lot about this displacement challenge that's being driven by technologies like automation and the need to rapidly reskill. But the other, the bright side of this is that if we do this, there's huge benefits to that because we've been facing a skills gap in the West and in the UK in particular for many years where we don't have enough people to fill the jobs that are opening up. And those are the kind of newish jobs that we have now, but the jobs that are on the horizon, the types of jobs and the opportunity for people to get into really interesting work is coming right down at us and um, they need people. So this is an opportunity for us to kind of throw aside the, the tendency that we have to um, look at our organizations in silos and say, well, we, we no longer need this kind of role. So we're going to get rid of the person in that role. But we have an opportunity over here that we're not thinking about um, because there's no way that person X is going to fit this um, opportunity Y. But actually, um, why not is the question. There are so... The, Techno technology skills are really important and they will continue to be important. But the value equally of the right kinds of behaviors and values and experience and knowledge and relationship with customers, you can't get that quickly um, and you can't get that through training courses. So encouraging people to, th encouraging us all and organizations to think about the opportunities that they have to address some of these challenges like displacement by looking inside their own organizations and giving people, their own people, a chance to step in to these new and exciting roles is another opportunity that really excites me. I couldn't agree more. You know, there's one thing that I, I take so much faith from, you know, lessons of history. 
you know, the idea of the Luddites um, came from the people smashing up the the advanced uh, spinning wheels and uh, spinning jennies, etc. Because the artisans were being put out of business because it was getting mechanization was making them redundant effectively, and so they smashed them up. But look at all the new people, all the new roles and jobs that were created since then, mm-hmm. since like the 1700s, 1800s. One personal thing on tech, I got my break in entrepreneurship because of the dot com boom. I saw tech as such a massive liberator and leveler. Um, my grandfather was a miner when he was 12. My dad was raised in a slum and was a manual laborer. It was tech that got me the chance to basically go on a different path from mm. what was being laid down for working class kids. And so there is the, the positive is massively always a negative. I think it's just we've been focusing on perhaps some of the responsibilities that comes with that success. Exactly. I'm um, glad you mentioned the the first industrial revolution <laughs> because this is kind of the the um, driver for us and our work on on that particular issue is the we are in the fourth industrial revolution right now. Um, so we've been through this three times before, and everyone always says that new jobs were created, um, so we shouldn't worry about the fourth industrial revolution. And I I kind of get that. There there are mixed views on the degree to which that's true this time around. But even taking a positive view and saying, yes, it will all work out in the end, um, it's just we have such an opportunity to learn what we to take what we've learned in three previous industrial revolutions and try to avoid some of the pain so people don't have to smash up the technology they they more of them will embrace it because we've brought people along with us exactly so um so let me come to our final question of the day jen i've really really enjoyed chatting to you and i was so looking forward to this podcast for some time now um Jen, I know that you'll have inspired so many of our listeners today the way you've inspired me. Um, What advice would you give to someone working in the tech space or indeed anyone interested in sustainability who want to play their part and create a more ethical digital future? That's a really good question, Mick. So I think there are, first of all, um, this is a growing space and it's, it's rife with opportunity for a huge number of different kinds of people. So you can be a techie and come in and focus on how to use technology and and data and sophisticated modeling to address things like climate change. Or you can come from a a humanities background or a pure business background. There are a huge number of roles we're seeing open up in the sustainability space and and technology and ethics space. Um, But primarily, I would just say be inspired by your own values and and what change you want to see in the world and bring that to your job organizations now more than ever are listening to their employees and to others outside their organization about their expectations of businesses and organizations playing a role in some of these issues so be that voice join the conversation and live your values in your work And then when you're ready, come and apply for some of the jobs that are opening up in this space. Excellent. Well, Jen, thank you so much for your time. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, Mick. It's been lovely.